welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, listen, are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord tonight? Well, praise God. I'm going to go ahead in a moment. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in, the prayer, in prayer. I want to encourage you as, as we uh, go before the Lord in prayer. Hey, listen, remember, we don't come into this place to hear from an old man, a young man, a black man, a brown man, a white man, a red man, anything, anything else that you can think of. We don't come to hear from a woman. We don't come for church, to come to church for entertainment. We come in this place to hear from God. So regardless of what you think or regardless of what you want, if you open up your ears to hear and you open up your eyes to see, I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will speak to you today. The word of the Lord never returns void, and I promise you'll get something out of this that will change your life today. So why don't we do this? Let's all stand together as we go before the Lord in prayer. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees. Father, we come before you in this place today, Lord, and we're just grateful that we have the opportunity to come to the house of the Lord. Father, I thank you. We don't take it lightly that we can come and freely worship you. When people around the world are dying, just read pages of the word of God. Here we are today basking in the presence of God openly and freely. Father, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church to be entertained. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And Lord, it's in the name of Jesus Christ, who we acknowledge as our senior leader of this church, we ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to us today, to speak to us. Lord, I ask that you would use me as a vessel to, to deliver your word in a clear and a concise way, Father, that I, play, I pray today that it would be a seed planted into good ground in our hearts and in our lives, that as we leave this place, God, we would be equipped by the Holy Spirit to go out and be full-time ministers of the gospel into our workplaces, to our families, and to our friends, and wherever else we might have influence, God. And we glorify you. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters all across the world and, and in the Inland Empire that are teaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ all this week and tonight. Father, at no time do we see ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather as co-laborers in the body of Christ. And so, Father, with that, we ask that you set your hand upon our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Adventist brothers and sisters and our Presbyterian and Lutheran and Methodist and Baptist brothers and sisters. And God, we ask in the name of Jesus that you set your hand upon Harvest and, and the Grove and, Father, on Sandals. And, and, Lord, I pray that you set your hand upon Ecclesiastes and Emmanuel, Baptist and Trinity, Father, uh, Abundant Living in Oak Valley. God, I thank you for our brothers and sisters at the Rock Church of Coachella Valley, of Riverside, of Temecula, and our brothers and sisters of Coastal Hills. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that you bless our fellow brothers and sisters of the Rock Churches, Lord, and, and bless them as you have blessed us today, Lord, and we thank you. And God, today on this Wednesday, as our nation mourns the atrocious events that happened on Monday, Lord, we ask right now for comfort to be upon the families of those affected by the mass massacre in Boston. Lord, and those who are affected by this, Father, we thank you that your comfort and the Holy Spirit be with them, Lord. And they may be asking today why, but God, we know who, and that is you are in control. And Lord, we thank you, Father, that you are in control. And Lord, we, we surrender our, our hearts and our will to you, Lord, and we glorify you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, amen. amen. Well, praise God. God is good. Amen. Well, I'm excited for the, what God's got in store for us tonight. I know that the message for tonight is going to be good. You're going to touch you. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans in the seventh chapter. Romans in the seventh chapter. Turn with me to the book of Romans in the seventh chapter. And as you're turning there, I'll give you the title of tonight's message. The title of tonight's message is, Where is the Fight? I remember now... Dad always told me, you know, listen, don't tell people your, your elementary or your high school stories because nobody cares, and I agree, nobody cares. I, you don't even remember your own stories, but I do remember one very specific moment of my life, and that was when I was a, 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 of the ripe old age of fourth grade. There in the, in the playground at the lunch recesses, there was a moment in my life that changed my life forever, and that was my first and only school fight. I remember vividly, I remember the kid's name was John, I remember I didn't know how to fight and he did, and I remember that the pavement was hot. <laughs> but you think, of that, uh, you think of that analogy of that story of the schoolyard fight and you know as well as I do that all somebody has to do is yell, fight, and a crowd emerges. Everybody wants to know, where's the fight? Where is the fight? Today, I want to talk to you about where is the fight. But I'm not going to talk to you about where you and I should be fighting. I want to ask you the question, 
where is the fight? With that, as you're in Romans, let me tell you a story, okay? Can, we, can I have story time? I like to tell my little boy stories at night. Can I take you to story time with me? I promise it won't be a little kid story, but it'll be a story. And for the sake of stories, I'll start it like this. Once upon a time. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a king. And this king had many servants. Now this king was different because he did something to his servants that no king ever had done. You see, this king loved his servants. So what this king did is this king took his servants together and he made them heirs or children into his kingdom, giving them a birthright into royalty into his kingdom. Now this king, because he did this to his servants, his servants went about everywhere they could telling everybody about what this great king who loved them so much had done. Now time had progressed and because they have said and because they're his servants or his, now his heirs and his, his children by birthright now, by heritage, have gone out and told everybody about what this great king has done and the love that he had for them and the fact that this king had done something that no other king had done, many people came into the kingdom. Many people said, well, I would like to be a servant of this king. And by becoming a servant, therefore, by the king's decree, they became heirs into the king's kingdom as well. And so now they had a birthright, and now they had royalty in their blood as well by this king's decree. Now time went by, and time went on, and progressed, and this king, he left, and he was no longer here. But his heirs, his children by birthright, his children by his decree were there, and they continued to spread the word about this great king and what he had done. And because of what this king had done, and because no other king had done something like this, this king's kingdom grew by leaps and bounds. And over centuries, this king's kingdom had grown to a point where it had spanned the modern world as they knew it at the time. Now this king's kingdom had expanded from the north to the south, to the east and to the west, and this king's kingdom was great. But now time had elapsed. And people didn't know this king personally anymore. All they knew was that they could become servants of this king's kingdom. And because they were servants of this king's kingdom, they, by, by decree of the king in the kingdom, could also have a heritage and have a nobility in them. And so, as time progressed, they began to learn about the king, but they didn't know the king personally. Now, there was two sections in the kingdom after several hundred years of this kingdom of growing there were two sections and two divisions within the kingdom. There was one group of people within the kingdom that decided because of this great gift that the king had given to them hundreds of years before that they would make it their personal point, that they would make it their life's devotion to know everything they could about this king. That everything this king had said everything this king had written, that they would study it, that they would write it, that they would gather together and, and think about it, and they would remember it so that they knew who and they fully understood who they were within this kingdom because of this king's gift. Now, on the other hand, there was a group of people that had been brought into this kingdom, and they, they had become servants of this king because that was the thing to, have, to do. Everybody else were servants of this king, and therefore, by, because of the king's decree, because they were servants, they were nobility. And so the people that, that, that bought into this realized that, hey, listen, all I have to do is know about this king and call myself a servant. And so they, because of their complacency with life, because of their satisfaction with where they were, did not make it a point in their life to study further into the things of this king, but rather to be happy with where they were and to rather to go about life as it went on. Well, this caused a division within the kingdom of this great king. And these two sides, the, the ones who drew close and the ones who were happy with what they were, got together and both sides agreed to separate and to split the kingdom right down the middle. On one side was those who drew closer to God. On the other side of this kingdom were those who were happy with, what they were, with where they were at. Now over hundreds of years, those who drew closer, closer to the king, those who drew closer to the king's decree, grew in the things and grew in their identity for who the king was. And those who did not stayed in the same position that they were, yet the kingdom still remained intact. Now I will say that those who grew closer to the king 
did not always make the right decisions or did not always make the right actions, but for the most part, they did the best they could to preserve the heart of the king and the message and the words of this king. Those, on the other hand, same thing, did not always make the right actions. And even though there were many in this kingdom who did not seek to go closer to the king, there were those in this divided kingdom who did seek to grow. Now, after hundreds of years of division, another ruler emerged. Now, this ruler emerged, and this ruler was different than the great king in the sense that this ruler did not love his servants, but rather required his servants to respect and to fear him as a ruler. And in doing so, rather than making his servants heirs or rulers or, or nobility in, within his kingdom, this ruler required that his servants become warriors. And these warriors of this ruler's territory or of this ruler's domain spread across this ruler's territory. And they spread like wildfire because they had a message of war. They had a message of a fight that said, serve my ruler or die. And what had happened is that because the kingdom was divided and because there were two sides, this ruler and his army swept through the lazy community or the lazy part of the kingdom from the old king. And that kingdom fell. That kingdom ceased to exist in the surface level, yes, there were those who drew close. Yes, there were those who put up a resistance. But for the most part, this ruler had wiped out that lazy community or that lazy kingdom. Now this ruler and his warriors sought to seek more and more ground as they progressed. And so they moved closer and closer to the territories of the king's kingdom that drew close to him. And as they began to find themselves in the territory of the king's kingdom and the king's nobility, they found themselves facing a fight because the king's kingdom or the people that de dedicated their life to knowing the king and because of knowing the king, knowing their place in this king's great kingdom, knew that nothing by any means would harm them or that nothing could change their identity because they were made nobility in the eyes of this great king. And so they fought for what they believed. And in this fight, they pushed back this ruler's warrior army back to the place where he had conquered. And from this day forward, the king's kingdom remains dominant in that land while the ruler's kingdom remains dominant in the land where he won. Now, obviously that was a fictional story, but that is a story in summary of the first 700 years of the history of the Christian church. And see, the king is Jesus. And Jesus took us, his followers, and the Bible tells us made us heirs and co-heirs with him. And as the church progressed and as Christianity became popular throughout the Roman Empire, people became complacent. And to the point of the Roman Empire split between the Eastern and the Western Empire. And the Eastern Empire found themselves complacent in where they were, happy in their traditions and their rituals, whereas the Western Empire found themselves wanting to expand the kingdom of God. And around 600 AD, a man by the name of Muhammad came and formed a religion that you and I know today called Islam. And that man, Muhammad, came with a sword to the Eastern kingdom, to the Eastern church, and he told this complacent church, serve my God or die. And they bowed down. So the question today, the title of today's message is, where's the fight? You see, I'm not talking about you and I fighting a religion, you and I fighting Islam. I'm not going there. That's not what it's about. That's, let it be an example for you and I that if we don't fight for our beliefs, if we don't stand for what we are, if we don't take it a point, make it a point in our lives to know who we are in Christ, the world, the enemy, our flesh will come knocking at our door and we will have a chance to put up a fight or give up. So the title of today's message is, Where is the Fight? You know an interesting statistic? Did you know that the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation took place in a country you and I know as modern day Turkey? Did you know that the evangelical center of the world 
was in a city called Antioch in a country you and I know as Syria? Did you know that Christianity was formed in a city that you and I know today as Jerusalem? Yet, Jerusalem's population is merely 2% Christian. Syria's population, which was once the center of Christianity, is 10%. Turkey's population is 2% Christian. Because there was no fight in the church. So the question today is where's the fight? I had you turn to the book of Romans in the seventh chapter. Romans in the seventh chapter. Look what Paul the Apostle says. Go ahead and put it up on the overhead. Romans in the seventh chapter. Paul says, I see another law in my members speaking about the Old Testament law. Speaking about his body, how he wills to do things, but he doesn't do them. And the things that he doesn't want to do, he finds himself doing. And here Paul the Apostle says, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity, the law of sin, which is in my members. Here the Paul the Apostle talks about the subject of spiritual warfare. Of spiritual warfare between our spirit and our flesh. There is a fight. Now I'm not telling you that you and I got to go out there and draw the sword and fight back, that you and I got to go slap those who aren't Christians, that you and I have to persecute those who don't believe God because, like the church, although they had, did not always make the right decisions, you and I need to follow our king's example and our king's lead. And that is not what Jesus Christ said for us to do, thank God. But there is a time where we have to stand and fight. Pastor Deborah, during our prayer meeting last week, inspired my thoughts and inspired my thinking. As we were praying, we were praying quietly. And she said to the staff, and she gathered them all together, and she said, you know, this church was born on faith. This church was born on the fervent, effective prayers of the righteous. And if we don't take a stand and pray and believe and grab hold of what God has called us to be, we will sink back into traditionalism and ritualism and we will lose out on what God has called for us. So today let's talk about where's the fight. And when I say where's the fight, I don't, I'm not talking about geographically. Hey, I'm not talking about regionally. I'm asking you the question about you. Where's the fight in you? Where's the fight in me? You know, it's always a statement of little guys. I'm tall. I'm six foot one. Pastor Jim's six foot four. So we see guys that are small people like my good friend, and I can tease him because he knows I love him, Elijah. You hear the statement like this, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, but it's the size of the fight in the dog. There's truth to that statement. And the question is, it's not about the size of the fight in you, but rather or the size of you in the fight, because it's not about you and me in our fight. But rather, what is the size of the fight in you? And what are you going to allow in your life to come and influence you? What are we going to allow affect us, influence us, allow to change our minds and our ways? What are we going to allow? It's a free will decision we have to make. And Paul says, listen, I've made the observation that there is a fight going on. That there is a battle of my flesh and my mind. Of my flesh and my spirit. Paul the Apostle says, I see another law warring against the law of my mind. Verse number 24, he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The question tonight, the thought for tonight, is let's talk about the fight of the flesh. Tonight, the fight of the flesh. To determine and to define fight, there are so many meanings of fight, but the fight is to put forth a determined effort to put forth uh, by, by emphasis of persuasion a fight or an argument. What are you going to put forth as a determined effort? 
Now I had you turn to Romans. Now go with me and let's make a human observation of the stat status of mankind by going with me to the book of Numbers in the 13th chapter. Numbers in the 13th chapter. Here, Numbers in the 13th chapter and into the 14th chapter, you and I will find something very interesting. And I believe that this is a very important event in the history of mankind. Here we find ourselves, here, the, here we find ourselves reading the children of Israel, the Hebrews, as they have left Egypt. Now they find themselves at the River Jordan crossing into what is to be the promised land. And Moses sends spies into the land. And they see that the land is flowing with milk and honey. But they see that there are also inhabitants of this land. Now I believe that this is a crucial part of human history because this is the revelation into the, the nature of mankind. The very nature that we are born into by just being human. In Hebrews, or I'm sorry, excuse me, in Numbers in the 13th chapter. In Numbers in the 13th chapter. As the spies come back from the land after being there for 40 days and 40 nights, they bring clusters of grapes so big that two men have to carry them together between themselves and attached to a pole. They bring great examples of fruits and they come back and they say, the land is flowing with milk and honey. Verse number 27, they told him, and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit, showing what they brought back. Nevertheless, despite what we said, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, meaning nevertheless, meaning regardless of what we just said. Moreover, meaning on top of what we just said. We saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, the Canaanites dwell in the sea among the banks of the Jordan. Verse number 30, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome. But then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report, saying, The land though, through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who saw it in it are men of great stature. Verse number 33. Then we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so were we there in their sight. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now going on to chapter 14. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and the people wept that night. And all of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. The question is, where is the fight? And I say this is a pivotal point in human history because this reveals to you and I the nature of our flesh. The things that you and I have got to flesh. Now tonight I want to talk to you about the fight against the flesh. And looking out of some of these things in Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, in, in Numbers, as well as we'll go to the book of Deuteronomy once again, we will see some things about the flesh that I know you and I can relate to. Now the fight of the flesh is a fight against doubt. Against doubt, human nature is this nature of skepticism, of doubt. Look what it says in Numbers. Go ahead and pop up the, the verse in Numbers. Verse number 31, the men who had gone with him said, We are not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. Do you realize, church, that they had been led to the promised land by a pillar of fire at night and a cloud of smoke by day that God had delivered manna from heaven to feed them? 
Do you not realize that they had seen Moses with the glory of God? That they had seen the presence of God on the mount? That these of all people, of any people, should know that God is with them. And here is the chosen people. Do, forget all of that. They walked across the Red Sea. Now, you've heard some people say, well, studying the charts and studying the possible routes, the Red Sea was probably only six inches deep, three feet deep, blah, blah, blah. That's great, because if you read the story, Pharaoh's army was drowned in it. So either way, it doesn't matter whether it was 300 feet deep or three inches deep. It's a miracle, and God parted the Red Sea and drowned Pharaoh's army in it. And here is the people led by God, protected by God, called by God, anointed by God. And now they come to the place where they have been promised by God. And they say, we can't do this. Filled with doubt. Human nature, church, our flesh says to doubt everything. Be a skeptic of everything. Show me the proof. Jesus' own disciple, Thomas, after Jesus' resurrection said, I won't believe until I see the print of the nails in his hand and the scars in his feet. And Jesus comes to Thomas, appears in the room, and he shows Thomas his nail-pierced hand. And he says to Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen you have believed, but blessed are those who have not yet seen and have believed. Amen. Church, the flesh nature, our flesh wants us to doubt. Is that really of God? Is that of God? Is that for today? Is God really want me to be healed? Does God really want me to be blessed? Does God really want my marriage to prosper? Does God really want me to be a good businessman? Does God really want me to be successful in life? Or does God want me to be miserable our nature our nature is to doubt but Jesus says church blessed are those who believe who have not seen hey let me tell you something I'll tell, I don't know about you but I know in my life I'm going to be blessed I know in my life my children are going to be blessed I know in my life my family's going to be blessed I know in my life my circles of influence because of the God inside of me is going to be blessed why I may not have seen it yet but I believe it we have got to fight fight the nature of doubt and not allow it to get a hold of us Otherwise, we'd be like the complacency. Secondly, human nature, as we see in this, it's human nature to complain. Did you know that it's human nature to complain? Listen to talk radio. Turn on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, Channel 7, Channel 28, whatever you want. No matter where you go, you'll find complaints. It is human nature to complain. And look what the Hebrews did. Look what they say, going through up the verse. All the children of Israel, in verse number two, complained against Moses and Aaron, the man that stood there with the rod and staff that God had given him and parted the Red Sea, the man that delivered rock, uh, water out of, this, out of the bitter spring, the man that came down from the mountain with his face shining in the presence of God. And they said, who is this guy? What is he doing what is this leader doing to us? It is human nature to complain. Did you know it is easy to complain because there's no resolution in complaining? It's easy to complain. It's easy to voice your complaints because there's no resolution. Because it's easy, guess what we do? We do it often. It's a vicious cycle of complaint. We complain because it's easy and because it's easy we complain. I once heard it said, everybody has a right to their opinion, but not everybody has a right to speak it. <laughs> Have you ever been around a professional complainer? When I say professional complainer, somebody that can complain about anything. Anything. 78 degrees and the sun is shining. There's no wind like there is today. Oh, yeah, yeah. the sun. Doesn't matter the event, doesn't matter the occasion, 
They can complain about anything. That's why we have the statements like, misery loves company. Birds of a feather flock together. It is human nature to complain. But look what it says in Philippians in the second chapter. I'll put it up on the overhead. Philippians in the second chapter, Paul is exhorting the church and he says, do all things. Do all things. Do, look, hey, 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 do what? All Say it again. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Do what? All what does all things mean? All things. Paul says, do all things without complaining and disputing. Look what he goes on to say, though. Verse number 15. That you may become blameless, harmless, children of God without fault. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you, speaking to the church, you and I, shine as lights in the world. Verse number 16. Do I have verse number 16 or is it just 15? Verse number 15. Just as whom you shine as lights in the world. What Paul is saying is, listen, do everything without complaining and disputing. Why? Because you might ruin your witness. Have you ever been inspired by an Eeyore personality? <laughs> well, I guess God is good today, even though I don't feel like it. Very uninspiring. As a matter of fact, if anything, it's inspiring to not be like them. If you've ever been around somebody that's ever complained, you know you've gone home to your wife or you've gone home to your husband and been like, oh my gosh, everything they said was negative. Please slap me if I'm like that. If anything, you know it's an inspiration to not be that way because it's human nature for you and I to complain. And you and I have got to fight the flesh to stop complaining. We want to complain about our leaders. We want to complain about our country. We want to complain about our taxes. Hey, we want to complain about our church. We want to complain about the word of God. But we have got to learn to fight the fight of the flesh and shut our mouths because there are some things that you and I not, need not say because God is in control, not us. Are you with me tonight? Talking about the fight of the flesh, I got to move. Complacency. Happiness. C'est la vie. It is what it is. Pastor Deborah's most hated statement in the world. And the one that Pastor Luke says too much. It is what it is. I am what I am. I am who I am. I was born this way. Complacency. Complacency. Look at Numbers, the 14th chapter, verse number 2, verse number 4. All the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said, if we had only died in the land of Egypt, or if we had died in the wilderness, they were happy dying as slaves. They were happy dying of starvation in the wilderness rather than fighting a fight. Church, what happens when we become complacent? Verse number four goes on to say, let us select a leader and go back to our slavery. Let us go back to Pharaoh who murdered us, who made us work, who doubled our work and took away our supplies. Do you realize that complacency within complacency is the loop and the cycle of sin that we find ourselves in time and time again because we tell ourselves that, you know what? I was better this way. Life was better before I got saved. I had more fun when I was not saved than when I wasn't a Christian. And we find ourselves looking back to the good old days rather than looking towards eternity. Human nature says, find a place. We are, you've heard the statement. We are all creatures of habit. Human nature says that we are creatures of habit. They wanted to go back. Jesus says in Luke, the ninth chapter, that anybody putting his hand to the plow, having looked back, is not fit for the kingdom of God. Shocking statement for Jesus. And what he is saying to you and I, church, is that you and I cannot plow our farm looking this way because we have no clue where we are going. But rather forget the past. Rather forget yesterday. Rather forget who you once were because you are not that person anymore. And now look ahead. Look forward to the crop ahead. Look forward to the harvest that God has got for you, like Jesus said. And believe it, even though you don't see it. Believe it. 
and shed complacency. It isn't what it isn't. Who says you can't be wealthier than you are now? Who says you can't be successful in what you do? Who says you can't be the manager or the owner of your company? Who says you can't be influential? Who says you'll never amount to anything? Certainly not God, but human nature. And if we don't fight that nature, we lose it. And we give into it. And we live a life that God has not designed for you and I to live. We miss out on the blessings of God. Are you with me today? Wow. Now quickly, in the next six minutes, I promise. I can't leave you with why we got to fight. I got to tell you how to fight. You got to know. You got to know how to fight. So quickly, really quick, very simple things for you to do. Write these down. I promise if you grab a hold, I, listen to me. I promise if you grab a hold of these, they'll change your life. And they're simple. What better could you ask? Simple life change. Simple life change. Huh? How to fight the fight. How to, how to fight the flesh. Number one, you've got to realize you're in a fight. You've got to realize you're in a fight. Did you know that the first stage, and some psychiatrists and some psychologists say, the first stage of change is denial? I'm not in a fight. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm good. This is the way I am. This is the way I'm supposed to be. This is as good as it's going to get, as good as it gets, Pastor Luke. You've got to acknowledge and realize that you're in a fight. Because if you don't, guess what happens? You don't fight. And if you don't fight, guess what happens when you're in a fight and you don't fight? Remember my fourth grade story? Remember I told you I felt that the, the asphalt was hot? That's because I got punched in the stomach. And I fell to the ground because he knocked the wind out of me versus me trying to slap at him. <laughs> if you're in a fight and you don't fight, you get beat up. I don't know about you. I don't want to be beat up the rest of my life. But what I would like to do is beat some devil butt. I don't know about you. you got to realize you're in a fight. Romans, Paul the Apostle says, I see a law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Who will deliver me? Verse number 24 from this, this body of death. But he goes on in the very next chapter to say that in Christ there is no condemnation, meaning that, listen, I may be fighting a fight of faith. I may be fighting against my flesh. I may do things that I don't want to do, but let me tell you something. I got Jesus Christ inside of me, and there is no condemnation. And I know that with Jesus in me, he says at the end of the 8th chapter, if God be for us, what? Who can be against? us we got to realize church we're in a fight and we got to fight if the enemy or the flesh since we're talking about the flesh can convince you because you know the flesh talks to you you know your body talks to you. You talk to yourself all the time. You find yourself stop, trying to stop eating the sweets you find yourself trying to stop drinking the soda and what do you do late at night oh my goodness if I could just have that cookie if I could just have that cake. You know it. If your body, if your flesh, if the enemy convince you that you are not in a fight, you've lost already because you didn't even show up. You got an F in attendance because you weren't even there. You forfeited. So you got to realize you're in a fight. Secondly, number two, you still with me today? You got to rely on God's grace. We've got to rely on God's grace. Listen, we don't do this on our own. This isn't a self-betterment course. This is a God-betterment course. That means God will make me better than what I am today because that is God's plan, and the grace of God will carry me there. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. You know this verse. Talking, Paul talking about the thorn in the flesh. Jesus Christ himself. Letters, words of Christ. And read in your Bibles, Jesus says to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. It's not about you and I. But rather, it's about you and I and our reliance on God's grace. The Bible says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So it's really a matter of fighting off our pride. Do you and I want to be proud and say, 
I can do this on my own, or should we be humble and say, I can't do this on my own? God wants you and I to be humble, to allow him and his grace to see us through. Because without the grace of God, we're on our own. And when we're on our own, history has shown us time and time and time again that we fail. So don't be prideful, but be humble and allow God's grace to get you through this. Last one for tonight. Are you still with me tonight? Are you still here? Last one for tonight. You have got to realign yourself with God's will. Realign yourself. Now I say realign, not align, because here's the, here's the reality of your life and my life. You and I are aligned with something, whether we know it or not. So by nature, because we are aligned with something, you and I have got to go through the process of realignment, meaning that we have got to change the direction of our focus to whatever it was we were thinking about, whatever it was we were focused on, and realigning or finding our tar target or finding our goal and saying, this is the direction that I want to go, and that direction for you and I, church, is the will of God. And we have got to realign our flesh with God. Because right now we're aligned with ourselves. We want to be there. Our body longs for that. But God says, no, be in my alignment. Be in alignment with me. Paul exhorts the young pastor, Timothy, verse number 11 through 12 of chapter 6. He says, but you, O man of God, flee these things, speaking of lusts and the things of the world. And he says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of the eternal life, which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We've got to realign ourselves, church, with the will of God. Like Pastor Dan says, we have got to stop our fight perspective being that if I can just get through today, tomorrow will be better. And rather look and say, well... I'm not going to have a day-by-day -day mentality, but rather I'm going to have an eternal perspective and realize that the fight I fight today has eternal consequences in the future and that God has got something great and mighty in store for me. And now while we may have to take the fight day by day, we know that we have a great future laid up for us with God. And when we realign ourselves with the presence of God. When we realign ourselves with the will of God, it doesn't matter what hell, what the spirit of, uh, of man, what your flesh can throw at you. It doesn't matter what the temptations of this world will throw at you. When you realign yourself with the word of God by getting into the word of God, by studying the word of God, the Bible says you don't go to battle without knowing what's going on, which means you may not have time in the time of temptation to say, what does the Bible say? Which means you've got to align yourself now and get into the word of God and study it now so that when life comes, when fight comes and knocks on your door, you're ready to put up your dukes and say, come on, let's have at it because I'm on the side of God and if God be for me, then who can be against me? And the man that I once was is no longer who I am and the word of God that says that I am a new creation holds true in my life and no longer am I who I am, but now I am who God says I am. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? God is good, and we got to fight the flesh. I like what the young people say. You got to punk the flesh. <laughs> got to fight it every day. The Bible says, Hebrews in the fourth chapter, and I'll finish on this. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. A two-edged sword strikes and slices no matter which way you swing. You start going like this, you hit something, it's getting cut. But look what it says, a two-edged sword. How about this? How about one edge for your flesh, one edge for the enemy? Discerning, piercing the division of soul and spirit joints and marrow, discerner in the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's a battle. It's a battle of the flesh, but it's a battle of the spirit against the enemy too, which brings us to the second part. Oh, we're out of time. 
have to come back next week to talk about the battle of the spirit. Did you guys get something out of that today? Why don't you give the Lord a great big praise? Hallelujah. I want to just do one more thing. Please don't get up. Please don't walk around. Not because I need you to pay attention to what I'm saying or because of who I am, but rather I want you to pay attention to the ministering of the Holy Spirit. And let me do this. It'd be a shame for me to have a message tonight, to, for us to have the presence of God in the, in, the, in the worship and praise, and to not give you the opportunity tonight to examine your eternal status with God. So let me ask you this question, and why don't you answer this honestly within your own heart? You know, nobody's going to know the answer except you and God, but the question is this. If you were to leave this place today, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? The question is really simple, but the truth is, is that nobody will know that answer except you and God. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I think I'm going to get to heaven. Pastor Luke, I hope so. I want to. Did you know that nowhere in the word of God will you find that you can think your way into heaven, that you can hope your way into heaven, or that you can desire to get into heaven so much that God will look at you and say, well, they wanted it bad enough. I'm going to let them in. Nowhere in the word of God will you find that. You know, you might even say, well, Pastor Luke, you know what? I don't see heaven. I don't see hell. I don't know if it exists. I don't believe in it. You might say that about yourself. You might say that, you know, just because you don't believe in heaven, just because you don't believe in hell, doesn't mean it's not real. Here, listen, I'm, love, I'm here to love you enough. I'm here to respect you enough I, to tell you the truth, not play games with you. Heaven's a real place. Hell is a real place. Just like maybe because you grew up in a place where you never saw a semi-truck, you could say, I don't believe in Freightliner trucks. But guess what? Go and stand in the slow lane of the freeway, and lo and behold, you'll meet one face to face soon enough. Just because you say you don't believe that hell's real or heaven's real doesn't mean it's not. It's real. It's time to get serious about that. You know, nowhere in the Word of God will you find that because your parents took you to church as children, because you were baptized or christened as a baby, because you attended Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes, does that mean that you're going to get into heaven? You won't find that in the Bible. Pastor Luke, I went to church on Christmas and on Easter. Pastor Luke, here I am today at church. Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you sit in church it means that you're going to get into heaven? You can't get to heaven that way. There's more to it than that, and we'll talk about it in just a moment. Did you know that you can't get to heaven because you've memorized John 3, 16 or a few other verses in the Bible? Because you've got a, a crucifix or a cross around your neck or St. Christopher around your neck? Because you've got a scripture tattooed or a Jesus tattoo somewhere on you or you've got a bracelet on? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in heaven, or in the, in the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, that the devil himself quoted scriptures to Jesus, yet he is not finding himself in heaven. Why? Because there's more to it than that. Hey, you can't get to heaven because you're a good person, because you've never cheated on your taxes. Thank you for not doing that. You can't get to heaven because you give to good charitable organizations, because you've never robbed a 7-Eleven. You've done more good in your life than bad. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that good people go to heaven, yet we believe that hook, line, and sinker. That because I'm good, I'm going to go to heaven. But the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags, that nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven, because it's not about that. Let me tell you a little bit more about how to get there. Jesus was having a conversation with a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. And Jesus was having this conversation. And he says to Nicodemus, to get to heaven, you must do this. You must be born again. Now, you've heard that term. You think, oh, man, that means radical, crazy, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. I don't care what Hollywood or popular culture or society is made out of that term. I don't care. Because from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. And it means this. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. Hey, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. God's not after a mental ascent towards him. God's not after carnal knowledge of who he is. Clearly we see that because the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who he is. You can't go anywhere in America without asking somebody who Jesus is. And they could tell you who he is, but it's not about knowing who he is, but it's about giving him all of your heart given him all your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church and he says, I know your deeds and when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold, he says, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. That when it comes time for you to meet him face to face, he better find you hot or cold, in or out. Well, what does lukewarm Luke Luke mean in terms of your relationship with God? Let me define it to you like this. It's like a warm soda on a hot day. It just doesn't do the job. Lukewarm in your relationship with God is a little bit in and a little bit out, floating around, occasional church attendance, you know, kind of doing this, kind of doing that, a little bit of God, a little bit of the world. You're riding the fence, doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing. 
And Jesus Christ says, if that's you living lukewarm, you are deceived in thinking that you're going to make it into heaven. Well, then how do we get there? You know, we can't get to heaven your way. We can't get to heaven my way. We can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way you and I can find ourselves in heaven is by God's way. Why? Because it is God's heaven, and the only way to God's heaven is God's way. And this is what Jesus Christ says. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. So you know what? Let's not do it any other way today but God's way. Here's what I want to do in a moment. I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your eternal position with God in heaven by giving you the opportunity to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. And here's what I'm going to do in just a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to go bang and smack my hand on the Bible just like that, real loud. And if that's you in just a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to pop your hand up. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand, when I count to three, you pop your hand up. What you're doing is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart, all my life. I want to make him the Lord and Savior of my life. Pastor Luke, I want to leave hell behind, and I want to go forward and have heaven in my future for eternity. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. You're saying, you know what, Pastor Luke, I can't raise my hand. If I do, I'm going to be embarrassed. Somebody's going to see me. The person that I came with tonight's going to know where I'm at. Listen, you might be embarrassed because you raised your hand, but get over it. Because isn't it better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God in a warm and welcome and loving place like the church? You see, Jesus Christ said that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. The decision is yours. God's not a manipulator or a conniver. He's not going to force his way in or make his way in. The reality of, of it is, is that God has already done everything he could by giving for you Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die, a beaten, bloody mess, to hang a spectacle on the cross for the world to see, so that in return, you could give him all of your life, all of your heart. The decision's yours. Who should raise their hand? If you've never given him all your heart, if you've never given him all your life in a moment, if that's you, when I count to three, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, I'll put it, you can put it right back down. We'll pray together after that. Who, sh who should raise their hand? If you're not sure, maybe you did this a long time ago or at a Billy Graham or a Harvest Crusade, but you never really followed through. Don't leave this place today without making sure. That's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. Who should raise their hands finally today? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, hey, today is the day of your salvation. If that's you, in just a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Hands getting ready to go up all over this place. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't miss out. Don't walk out of this place without making sure. God's already done everything he could, and now all he wants is your heart, your life. Make the decision today. We love you, and we support you, and we want you to do this today. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. If that's you from the front to the back, family room, if you're watching in the outer foyer or you're watching online, you can raise your hand wherever you're at. You stop what you're doing, and you raise your hand. Make the public profession for Jesus Christ today and go forward for God in your heart and your life, and we'll pray together in just a moment. If that's you, here we go. I'm going to count to three. Get ready. Today is the day of your salvation. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. Where are you at today? Anybody else? Anybody in the place? I see you right there. One, I see you. Two, I see you right there. Three, I see you. Three wise people. Anybody else today? Oh, I know there's more than you. More than three. Where are you guys at? I see a hand over here. Four, I see you right there. Four wise people. Anybody else in the place today? I see everybody. Five, I see you back there. Where are you guys? Six, I see you right there. Seven, I see you. Eight, I see you back there. Eight wise people, where are you at? You know there's eight, you know there's ten. Where are you at? I see, I see you right there, number nine. In the family rooms, where are you guys at? Oh, I see everybody pointing in every direction. Where are you at? Give me a little wave. I see you right there. I see you right there. That's eleven. Eleven wise people, where are you guys at? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. I need to go forward for God. Hey, do it today. Do it today. Today is the day of your salvation. If you wonder if you should, get your hand up. If you're wondering if I'm ever going to shut up, get your hand up. Anybody else in this place today? Eleven wise people. Anybody else today? Anybody else? I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. If that's you in this place, come on. Make today the day of your salvation. Leave hell behind and go forward for eternity in heaven. Anybody else? Eleven wise people. Anybody else today? Anybody else today? Eleven wise people. Well, praise God for eleven wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. All 11 of you, number, thir number 12, 13, 14, 15 of you that didn't raise your hand, but you should have. It's not too late. Remember I said you said you want to give them all your heart, all your life. I said we'd pray together. Now here's the time. I want you to be bold. In a moment I'm going to ask you, 
Everybody to stand, and we're going to sing a song together. If you raise your hand, or if you should have raised your hand, I want you to be bold. Grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend, somebody that sat next to you, whatever it is. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get in the aisle, and come and meet me at the altar, and let us change destinies together. When, as we stand together, please, let's all stand. If that's you in this place, come forward. Please, nobody leave as they come forward. If that's you, come on, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair from the front to the back. Come on, you can come. Come on, if that's you, you come. Come on, you can come from the back, from the front, wherever you're at, you come, come on. Come on. You can come, come on, we'll wait, you come. We'll wait for you. You come on. You can come. Come on. We'll wait. Well, praise God. Hey, listen, I want something. I want all of you to do something, okay? I want all of you to smile. You know why? Because you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life in Christ. Here's what I want to do. I want to invite, her, I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? This is Pastor Joe L. Like no L, but Joe L. Pastor Joe L is a really cool guy. What he's going to do is he's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Hey, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and your Savior. He's going to help you. Real easy stuff. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information, some literature that we have at the church, a book that our senior pastor wrote, very small, very easy reading, that, you know, you ask the question, what do I do now? We want to help you with that. It's called Welcome to Your Destiny. The third thing he's going to do is he's going to introduce a friend to you. We give away friends here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We call them SPTs, Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, they help you work out and make sure you don't waste your time. We got spiritual personal trainers, somebody that will meet with you before church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee. They'll teach you some things about the Word of God for, for five weeks, get you involved, get you strong so that you don't go back to the life that you came from and you get strong in the ways of God and you go forward for all that God has for you. So we give friends away at the church. So here's what I want to do. I want to have you just turn over to your left, my right. Go right over there with Pastor Joel. 